Well, Jason is right. I have spent the past 15 years living in the land of perpetual adolescence, middle school. There is nothing like a middle schooler to help you remember the beautiful awkwardness of becoming independent. I had the opportunity to take some of my middle schoolers and a few high schoolers to the Marissa Arts Exchange last week. There's 110 students that gather from around the region to geek out in drama, art, dance, and music. And I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that most of my middle schoolers were in the drama strand. <laughs> they were fearless, they were fun, and they were joyful in that black box theater. But that's actually not the story I want to tell you today. The story I want to tell you is about when I found them in the art classroom. There were student-led workshops, and the one they picked was stenciled graffiti art, sanctioned graffiti, spray cans in the hands of middle schoolers. My inner middle schooler was giddy with excitement, so when I walked up to the table, I was expecting not what I found. They were talking about their design, but there was obvious tension, stress, and they were arguing. So I blurted out, what are you afraid might happen? And one of them looked up at me and said, but it's so permanent. And I laughed because she was hilariously overdramatic, but I reassured them that in all honesty, this could be painted over. It actually was not permanent. And with a look of relief and grins, they got right back to work. And of course, I ceased to exist. It was like I was invisible again. But they were focused on the parts of the creativity process that they were energized by. So this conference has been about fostering creativity and innovation. And much of the conference has been focused on the last part, the innovation part. Well, what about the first part? What is it about the act of being creative that we need to think about? What does it actually take to support the ability for students to be creative? So thank you, Heidi and Evan, for verifying that when I Googled this, <laughs> that was the, one of the first steps. One of the people I found to help me on my way was Diana Peteru. She is a counselor and a blogger out of Colorado. On her blog, she wrote that creativity demands vulnerability. Ah, there's a direct link in her mind between these two things. Well, that sent me on another path. So then I found Dr. Brené Brown. She is a researcher and storyteller at the University of Houston. She also happens to be a best-selling author and her TED Talks have garnered millions of views. I turned to her work to better understand the concept of vulnerability. So Dr. Brown says that vulnerability is actually being uncertain, taking risks, and being emotionally exposed. So my brain was making all these connections. I was like, okay, so we're asking students to be creative, which means we're demanding that they be vulnerable, which means we're asking them to be emotionally exposed. So if you put that together, when we ask our students to be creative, we are asking them to be emotionally exposed. And then I thought about my middle schoolers. That's their least favorite part. So just as I'm having my epiphany, Dr. Brown throws this out. She said that when she was doing her research, 85% of her interviewees experienced a shaming incident in school that significantly altered their view of themselves as a learner, 85% of them. Then she went on to say that the normal reaction to shame is to reduce your vulnerability and to reduce your emotional exposure. So if shame gets entered into the environment, we're reducing the ability to be vulnerable, which means we're reducing their ability to be creative. Well, that is certainly something to think about. So if anyone tells you that the touchy-feely part of school is not important, that it doesn't matter, 
They're just wrong. It does. And in fact, in my short exploration of vulnerability and creativity, the very environments that we're seeking to create that are filled with innovative, creative experiences requires us to focus on these things. It's an imperative. So then I thought back to Marissa. Here you have these teachers who took 110 kids that didn't know each other from schools that they didn't ever, have never been to. How did they do it? Because they did it in a matter of minutes. I noticed that one of their main focuses was on building personal connections. So they worked on breaking down barriers between kids. They worked on breaking down barriers between adults and kids. The very first night at the teacher's meeting, they talked about the importance of learning student names. Because they said that if you can call them by name, they will feel that you know them. They also worked on building authentic collaborative experiences that provided support and ultimate freedom at the same time. Seems contradictory, but it definitely was intentional on their part. This intentional focus on building an environment that could support kids helped when they faced fear that stifled their creativity. Helped them to move to a place where they were willing to be vulnerable, to demonstrate their creativity and to be innovative. So those girls sitting at the table, stifled, became these girls at the end. We all know that there are places our students are willing to be vulnerable and creative and innovative all on their own. And we also know the places where they're not. So how do we ensure a learning environment that allows for that vulnerability and creates opportunities for our students to feel like that at the end of the experience? Thank you.